We're continuing in art style files with F for fashion with my special guest, Jessica Durant. And I have Jessica Durant here. So excited to talk to her about her approach to fashion illustration and how we can incorporate that into our style. So Jessica, would you call fashion a style? Because I know right now it's like your whole job. How how do you define that? Because I know as a little girl, I thought I had to be a fashion designer in order to do fun paintings of girls in dresses. But you found that there's another way. So how would you describe fashion or fashion illustration? Yeah, what's interesting is I think with um, a lot of people who actually study fashion design, sometimes they go down the route of really falling in love with fashion illustration and not necessarily kind of the typical ways that people illustrate fashion where it's like a flat lay, where it's a technical illustration. Because I think any fashion designer is going to have technical illustrations, but then they're also going to have fashion illustration where it brings the garment to life. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people that contact me that want to do what I do actually started in fashion design. And then they realized they just love doing that part of it more than actually creating the, the garment. And, um, but I got into it because my mom um, is a seamstress and she would make me garments as a little girl. And I, as much as I loved watching her sew, like there was never, I never wanted to sew, but when we went to the fabric store together, that's when I discovered that there were uh, pattern books and in the pattern books, you know, these big, huge things that you'd flip through were um, the patterns that had fashion illustrations on them. And I would just sit there and like, you couldn't buy them. You had to always like leave them there. And so I would just like try to look at them and like visually memorize them. And just, I just was so excited about that. And then later on, when I was in college, I discovered that uh, the archives at our library where they had all the Vogue's and the Harper's Bazaar um, every issue. And so like then I discovered that fashion illustration was like a viable career for people in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, and then it had like a boom again in the 80s. And when I was in school, it really wasn't there might have been a few a handful of illustrators who were who were doing it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had a feeling, I thought, you know, I think it'll come back. I, I, I'd seen the trend kind of like go away and come back. And I, as I was studying fashion, and I learned trends. I kind of saw that everything does come back. So I just think there was a, a hope inside of me that was like, this is what I'm really passionate about. Like I love painting and I love drawing, but there's something about bringing, um, the combination of my, my love of like painting women and my love of like garments. But then I, I always tell people now I'm like, uh, fashion illustration has been around forever. I mean, we think about Egyptian art. It was all about the cat eye, the jewelry, like everything was about that. And every great painting you really look at in history, mm -hmm. it's it really has like that element of bringing like the, the garment and the, the silk or the, the fabric to life and, it's always such an essential part of painting people. So I think like for me, I'm, I'm just illustrating what I love. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that I get to do it. And it doesn't mean that my career is always just strictly about fashion, but it, I feel like that's like the gateway that people find me and whether they want to use me for like beauty illustrations, or maybe to put those types of figures into um, a narrative or a scene, sometimes it will translate to that. But really my whole career began because I emphasized like my love of women and, and painting them and making them feel a little bit more emotional and a little bit more dynamic than maybe some of the fashion illustration that you see sometimes that feels a little like Barbie doll. Actually, so. when, when you were talking about the pattern books, I was thinking of like simplicity and like, they were mm -hmm. all very, uh, not super anatomically correct, but you know, they were somewhere between like, true anatomy and cartoony but that's not yeah. really like the kind of work that you've developed you were talking about how your style shows uh, more emotion I'd say mm -hmm. elegance you like to really revel in your medium how how do you go about that what what do you remind yourself at, as you're working on your work mm -hmm. creating mm -hmm. those forms I definitely think that I 
when I sit down to create, I'm either kind of sitting down, I'm very aware of my emotions at any point in time and how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it took me years to like figure that out because when I first started creating, um, like I, after college and after I had like kind of taken a break from it and then came back to it, I first was creating just to kind of get get back into it, get into that process of like creating every day and seeing if I could develop my skills without having a professor or, you know, people critique me. I think it takes a bit of time to figure out how to like listen to your own intuition. And so I was doing that. And then, then my life kind of turned upside down in the relationship that I was in. And, I, you know, I was going through a lot of like dark times and then I, I was painting and I started to notice that everything I started painting started changing, going down a different path where I was, my emotions were kind of coming through, or I was choosing figures that already kind of looked like me or made them look more like me. So it was like, I was kind of doing a self-reflective work. And um, those pieces were the pieces that really started to like open doors for me. And it took me, you know, when you're in it, you're not really you haven't had time to process it. So by the time, you know, I looked back and was like, it became my full-time career because of, you know, my Etsy shop and then having freelance work. I was like, oh, the reason this work is good is because I was in touch with my emotions and I was being vulnerable and I was painting how I was feeling. So there are many times when I do kind of go into that mindset but then there are times when I think like we just have to be normal people and we can't, we, you know, we just want to paint something that makes us feel good. That's, that's joyful. You saw something that you were inspired by. So I think both of those things are really important when you're creating, but I do think it's the more you're in touch with your emotions as an artist, like the better your work will be. Um, and oftentimes because we are alone with our thoughts, like we, we really have to be, um, you know, it's, it can be easy to kind of go down a path of getting in your own head, but I think it's, it's really important to, to reconnect to like why you do what you do, where you're at at this point in your life, what's your point of view, what do you need to say, what can you create that's going to help you move forward and evolve not just as an artist, but as a person. I know I kind of went down a tangent, but that's... <laughs> no, I, I love that you're talking, you're speaking directly to the artist's soul, more so than yeah. creating. But I would say that what you're saying is, you can, can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that your your approach to really facing your emotions has influenced and impacted the quality of your work. And therefore, as you saw, the quality was there because of that, you've really leaned into that even more. So anybody yes. who knows me knows I love the word bold. And I would say that watching you paint like on Instagram live or whatever, you are bold where you go straight to that dark color that then just like oozes into the page because mm -hmm. you're using inks mm -hmm. or watercolors, some mm -hmm. beautiful fluid medium. How can we inspire like more boldness like that in ourselves? Yeah, I think that so many people, especially with watercolor, if they're using it or inks, they get very uh, afraid to like go in there and just like start working and make that first mark. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I always encourage people to do is like have a stack of an expensive paper even a little bit larger than what you would normally work because I think when we were smaller we tend to like kind of get a little bit more tighter in the way our bot we hold our body and our hand and we we start to like question I think if you work larger and you use a paintbrush and you kind of use more of your wrist and in, in your hand and you stand back and you know that always helps me but I also think it's like really important to kind of create like a vibe when you're you're you know you are going to be sitting and painting like to to get into the joy of it get into the fun part of it and not the part where you're like constantly in your own head and like it really pays to like loosen up and one of the things we would always do in school was like timed illustrations where 
you were, whether you were painting a figure and you gave yourself like 60 seconds and then you would do a different pose and you just keep going. And, um, that I always say is such a great way to start off before you are creating and do it without any distractions. And I have to remind myself that all the time where I'm like, I always really have my breakthroughs when I put my phone away I give myself a dedicated block of time where I'm not going to check my emails. I'm not going to look at my phone and I'm going to like put on music or put like today I put on Napoleon dynamite and I was like, I've been, I'm doing exactly what I'm saying to do because I'm working on a bunch of um, curriculum and content for a class I'm teaching. So I'm just trying to have those moments where I'm just like allowing myself to be free and liberated with how I create. And I think that like at the end of the day, you just need to remember it's just paper, it's just paint. And like, if you don't like it, throw it away and move on to the next one and just keep going and keep keep allowing yourself to kind of get back in that childlike state versus like the adult that you are that's like what if I make this and it's not good or like nobody's gonna like it you know like, so grown up yeah <laughs> 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 so it's like you you have to really channel your inner child and that really helps when when you're creating I think I loved listening to this and if anybody else feels like they need to re-watch this or listen to it while they work, I think I might be doing the same. <laughs> you also offer offer mentorship from time to time. How can people get in touch with you and just know what's going on in your life at the pace that you go? The easiest way is my website, which is jessicadurant.com. It's two R's. Um, and I do offer mentoring from time to time because that's probably a very, very common uh, question that I get asked. I get DM'd a lot about it. Um, and so I try to offer it, you know, once a year for a few months just to kind of get in touch with people who are really trying to like get more insight into like the professional business side of the of the art world. And um, I'm really excited to actually have a course that not only has curriculum that I'm excited about, that I, I'm saving things that I've never taught or shared ever before online. So that's where I'm like, this is going to be good. But the fact that it, it will be accessible to a lot of people. And uh, that's probably one thing that I'm very, very excited about. Thank you for sharing your heart with us, Jess. It's been fun. You are so welcome. <laughs> If you want to dabble in fashion illustration, check out this month's video on fashion. We do faces and figures for a challenge. To learn more from other artists who are displaying all these wonderful styles, continue watching this series here on YouTube.